to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you thought through the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath, till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of all shall not kneel and shall not faint. By his blood and on his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise, praise the I worship you. 
Even when I see it, you're working. Even when I feel that you're working, I never stop, I never stop working. I never stop, I never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working, I never stop, I never stop working. I never stop, I never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way make a miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Praise God. Even when we don't see it, he's working. Amen? Amen. He is good. 
contortionist this morning, moving all this stuff around, holding it all up. Thank you, worship team, for taking the time to rehearse and put those songs together. It's going to be a blessing to us as we enter into worship and praise our Savior. Amen? Thank you. Nice job on the harmonies, Jimmy. Crushed it. God's good, amen? It's good to be here with you all on this nice, sunny, warm day. It's all good. It's supposed to break, though, here. A couple people told me this morning, so I'll be thankful for that. We need the rain. It's coming, so we'll take it. We'll take it. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to those that are online for joining us in the building. Um, we have a new connection cards. If there's a way that we can serve you or a way that we can pray for you, please take a moment, fill that out. If it's your first time, there's connection links on the website. Um, you can also go there and uh, fill that out. We, get, we don't ask for much information. We aren't going to spam you and send you a bunch of stuff. But it's just a way for us to serve you better. Amen. So if you get a moment, go ahead and fill that out. Thankful for what God is doing, doing in my life and the life of the church. Amen. A couple quick announcements. Next Saturday, July 30th at 8.30 a.m., we are having a safety and security training. I've reached just about everybody. I think i got like one more person I have to talk to. We've been playing phone tag. Um, but if you've signed up to help in kids, youth, or in security, we're asking that you come to that training next Saturday. It's happening here at the church at 8.30 We'll be done no later than 11.30. We could get out early, maybe. I won't promise, but we will do our best. And uh, it'll be a good morning to get together just to talk about some safety things and how we can serve kids and the youth here at Hope Springs Church and in our community. Amen. So join us for that. And then the following Sunday, the next day, July 31st at 11 a.m., we are having our family picnic, our church family picnic. This is for you, for your family, for our friends. It's okay if you'd like to invite somebody, go ahead and do that. Invite your friends, invite your family to be a part of that day. And uh, we're asking that you bring a dish and a dessert that you can share with everybody. And um, it'll be a nice time together. We're going to break out the grills. We're going to have some hot dogs, hamburgers. And it'll be a nice time of just playing games, hanging out, and getting to know one another. The lake is there if you want to swim. We're going to be under the pavilion. It is rain or shine because we don't have a rain date. You lease it for that. You, you get the space for that one block of time, and they don't give you an alternative. So anyway, I look forward to seeing you all there. It's going to be a nice time. Those that are online, please join us next week. You are welcome to come. Invite your friends. Invite your family as well. We're at meeting at 11 a.m. There is no regular Sunday morning service, right? No service here at the church. The doors will, the doors will be locked. They, maybe. We'll see. We're probably moving stuff at 10 a.m. But <laughs> there's no regular service next Sunday, July 30, um, 31st. We're going to be fellowshipping and hanging out at our family picnic. Sound good? I'm excited about it. should be a good time. Time of just being together. Nothing like being together with the body of Christ, my brothers, sisters, with our family, right? It's good. Well, this morning we are going to continue in our preaching series for this summer called the Summer of Bliss. And this is week four of eight weeks of where we're walking through the Beatitudes found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And these verses are contain the Beatitudes, which are just statements of blessedness that Jesus gave to us when he walked here on earth. And at the start of his great sermon, the ser he started to preach this at the Sermon on the Mount. Most of us as believers, or just as humans, right, we have this idea that we can find happiness searching in a bunch of different places. We, we say, hey, when... I get to this place in life, then I'll be happy. When I graduate, I'll be happy. When I get my first car, then I'll be happy. When I get my dream car, then I'll be happy. When I meet and marry my beautiful spouse, then I'll be happy. And I'm happy. 
I don't know about you. I'm happy with my spouse. Thankful for her. Amen. So grateful that I'm happy when I got there. But we, we've learned over the last couple of weeks that when it comes to creating our own happiness, chasing after all kinds of things, that we will never accumulate enough of whatever it is that we think we need in order to make us happy. In our own power, we have no ability to achieve true happiness in our life. Solomon, a king in scripture who had everything, went as far as to say, he, I hated my life. It was all in vain. All of it, it was meaningless. It was like chasing after nothing. But here in Matthew chapter 5, we get these great opening lines with Jesus' famous sermon. Here he gives us these eight positive statements about happiness. And they've been titled the Beatitudes. Jesus gives us here eight qualities or eight characteristics, eight attitudes that as followers of Jesus, they would cause us to be more like him, to have happiness in our life. The word Beatitude simply means blessedness, happiness, blissfulness. And that's what these verses are all about. Let's read them. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Seeing the crowd, he went up the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and, they op- and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evils against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And when you read these or you hear them, these statements sound kind of irrational. Happy if you are meek. Happy if you are a peacemaker. Blessed if you mourn. Happy if you are persecuted. But here, Jesus lets us know that you and I can be happy despite all of our circumstances. If we would just put these things into practice in our life, we will find, we will find true happiness in every situation that we find ourselves. If we have the right attitude, if we have it, the joy and the bliss that comes from knowing Jesus, it will radiate from our lives. But we must make a conscious choice to choose to live like him. The Beatitudes given to us by Christ are attitudes to live by. We need to live by them. The first week we looked at verse 3, it said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We learned that to be poor in spirit is to be humble. And that living humble, we can reduce our stress in our life. We improve our relationships. And we release God's grace to work in our life. We learn that God helps those who humble themselves. In week two, we looked at verse four. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Those who mourn are those who are brokenhearted and they're hurting. And for us to be comforted in that mourning, in that pain, in that suffering, there are some basic steps that we can take. First was to recognize that God is present. He knows. He cares. He helps. Next was to release it to God. Give him the hurt. Don't dwell on the past. Don't resent it. Don't relive it. Don't repress it but release it. Let him have the hurt. We need to rely on God's resources 
his resources for our life was what? His word, right? It started with his word, and then it was with his family, each other. We need each other, brothers and sisters in Christ. We aren't designed to walk our faith journey by ourselves, amen? And then lastly was to depend on the resource of the Holy Spirit in our lives, our comforter, his peace, the very presence of God in our lives. And then last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 5, and it said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We learn that biblical meekness is strength under control. It's the wild horse tamed, and it's harnessed, and yet it's still powerful. It's the powerful, victorious general who spares a conquered people. It's the passionate person unwavering in his conviction, yet gentle, kind, and benevolent, just like Jesus. It's just like him. It is power. It's the power of his love under control in our lives. Meekness in the life of the believer looks like happy are the meek. Happy are those that are thoughtful and not demeaning to those that serve us. Happy are those that commend and not condemn those that disappoint us. Happy are the meek, those who have compassion and not capitulation when it comes to someone who disagrees with us. Happy are the meek for they're teachable. They're not egotistical. Happy are the meek, they take action and they don't have reactions. They don't return evil for evil when someone hurts them. And this morning, we're going to look at the fourth of these Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. And it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Can we pray this morning? Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, we come to you. We thank you for your righteousness in our lives. Your love, it never fails. Your word tells us that you love righteousness and you love justice and that all the earth is filled with your unfailing love. Help us today to be living examples of that, filling the earth with your love this morning, to walk holy to walk pleasing and acceptable to you this morning. Father, this morning I lift up all those that are sick, whether here in the building, watching online, streaming the service at a later date. Lord, I lift them up to you. Lord, I know there's at least two that are home this morning, sick, one with migraines, another with blood sugar issues. Lord, I just ask that you would just surround them, comfort them, Bring a healing touch to their body, Lord, as they rest this morning. For those that may be facing mental health issues, depression or anxieties this morning, we lift them up to you. I pray your peace and your healing touch on their life this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, touch them with your healing touch like only you can do. Holy Spirit, give us wisdom today to seek the righteousness of God, to seek his kingdom that we can eat and that we can drink and we shall be satisfied this morning. Speak to us through your word that we may grow in you, in our faith, in our walk, as we follow after Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Just saying it makes me thirsty. I'm a big water guy. I drink about 100, I'd say about 130, 140 ounces of water a day. 
Like it's going out of style, but it's got to be cold. It can't be room temperature. I don't know why. It has nothing to do with my sermon. I'm just thirsty all the time. Satisfied here means to be filled. Having your desires fully gratified and to be made content. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because that hunger and that thirst shall be fulfilled. You will be content. You'll be fully gratified. In this country, most of us don't know what it really means to go hungry or thirsty. After all, America runs on Duncan, right? It's eating good in the neighborhood, or I'm loving it. Or if it's thirsty, it's taste the feeling. But Mother Teresa once said that in India, they are starving physically, but in America, they are starving emotionally. And every single one of us, every single human being, has a spiritual hunger inside of us. It's probably not what we'd call it. We wouldn't call it that. But we all have an emptiness that we are trying to fill. Some may say things like, man, I'm just trying to fill a void. Or I'm just trying to find myself. Or there's something missing in my life. There's got to be more to life than just what it is that I'm living for. And so even when things are at their best and everything is going just how we think it should go, too often we still feel that there's a void. There's still something that's missing. It's, it, eats at, it eats at us. I can't get no satisfaction by the Rolling Stones. was even the anthem for a whole generation of people. I can't get no satisfaction, right? So why is it? Why is it there are so many people who are just walking around living unsatisfied? This verse doesn't directly say why they're unsatisfied, but it clearly has implied that if someone is not satisfied, they're looking in the wrong place. We're talking about finding happiness. We're talking about finding happiness in every situation in our life, right? So let's talk about a few places where we won't find happiness, where we won't find satisfaction for our lives. Number one, we're not going to find it in pleasure. If I could just take a long walk on a beach, if I could travel the world, if I could watch the perfect sunset, if I could be independently wealthy, then I'll be happy. We're not going to find it in pleasure. Ecclesiastes 1.8 says this, All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The New Living Translation says it like this, Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we're never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not satisfied content. We don't find it in pleasure. Almost every ad on social media or on television appeal to our desires, right? Starbucks is coffee that inspires. Coke is open happiness or twist the cap of refreshment. The taste that satisfies. Have you ever had a desire to go raid your refrigerator? I know I have. I'm not usually one that wakes up late at night to do it, but a lot of times I'll be sitting around watching a movie later in the evening or watching something on TV, and all of a sudden I get a craving, and I don't know what it's for. It's usually just this uncontrollable urge. i got to go to the fridge. Have you been there? We don't know what we want, but we're hungry. So we open the door, and then my wife will say, what are you looking for? Right? What are you looking for? I don't know, but I'm looking for something. And I'll just stand there and I will stare into the fridge. And maybe I'll find something to nibble on. And then I'll go back and sit down. And a few minutes later, I'll get back up and go back to the fridge, not knowing what I want. But I look and I stare even more. And then I'll find something else to chomp on. And then before you know it, I walk over to the cabinet and I'm looking for something in there. 
all kinds of good stuff just staring at me, but I don't know what I want. I don't know what's going to fill that craving. We don't know what it is most of the time that's going to bring us satisfaction. If you're like me, you start with what maybe sounds good, something sweet. That's going to be it. That's going to be take care of it. Or then you go to something salty. You think that's going to take care of it. Or maybe you go to the leftovers from the night before. You think that's going to satisfy you. But before you know it, you're eating olives and peppers and spoonfuls of peanut butter to try to figure out what's going to make you satisfied. Listen, all these things are good on their own, but they never satisfy you. Nothing ever really looks good. Nothing really ever tastes good. And that's how it is for us in life sometimes. That's how it was for me before I met Jesus. I was willing to try anything. We take drugs. We get drunk. We sleep around. And for a season, these things bring a certain amount of satisfaction, but it never lasts. It never lasts. It never fills the void that we have in our life. In Hebrews 11, Moses was offered all kinds of pleasures, the pleasures of Pharaoh's house. But look at what it says in verses 24 through 25. It said, by faith, when he was grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with, people, uh, with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin. Enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. I almost missed that word in there. Sin, living for the pleasures of this world and this life is but for a season. They are fleeting. They are pleasures of this world, and they don't satisfy, and they have no eternal value to our life. Proverbs 21, 17 says this, Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. We are spiritually poor when we seek after pleasures. Don't get me wrong. Having pleasures in life in itself is not a sin. Enjoying life, enjoying the beach, enjoying the sunset, enjoying your vacation and your family and your friends and all these things. These are not sinful, right? But when our lives revolve around our pleasure... Our love, our hunger, our thirst for pleasure is greater than that for the love of God. We've missed the point. Blessed, blissful, happiness is the satisfaction that we find. And we don't find it in pleasure. And we don't find it in, our second one is in performance. We don't find it in our performance. Overachievers and workaholics would know exactly what I'm talking about. Ecclesiastes 2, 22 through 26 says, What has a man from all the toil and striving of the heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his works is vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This is also vanity. There is nothing better for a person that he should enjoy should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his soil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him who can eat or who, has, who can have enjoyment, for to the one who pleases him from God, has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. That is also vanity. It's striving after wind. Even in the night, his heart does not find rest. You know, we think success produces satisfaction for our life, but it's a lie. It's a fairy tale. Many successful people are completely unfulfilled. We see in athletes, we see it in our sports stars, and we see in actors and actresses and business leaders. They achieve these great successes, and yet they find an emptiness in their life that causes them to move on to the next thing, to the next challenge that they think is going to fulfill 
There's satisfaction. They're chasing a feeling. It's more than a feeling. I can't think of the song, right? They're chasing a thrill, a momentary high. Yet after the thrill of winning, the emptiness, the void is still there. Always working, but never satisfied. We think that if we earn a promotion or gain recognition or reach a goal, if we receive applause of man, we receive achievements, that we are going to be satisfied, but we won't be. Because our happiness, our satisfaction, and it's not found in our possessions. Has anybody ever watched the show Hoarders? Anybody ever seen it? I don't know what I'm talking about. Right? Every episode has someone who, who in their heart, in their life, completely believes their happiness depends on the things that they own. The things that they surround themselves with. I've seen this in the lives of people close to me. They think happiness comes in the next purchase, in the next big deal, in the next deal they get. Shopping channels, the, the late, no, late night infomercials all play on this emotion in people's lives. Yet the majority of those purchases get put up on a shelf and they sit in rooms and they fill houses with clutter. It becomes a junk pile bought with the wrong intent to fill a void that can only be filled by Jesus. Amen? Look at what Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. It says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys. And where thieves do not break in to steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The treasure, the possessions that we strive for, they have no eternal value. When I get the nice car, when I get that nice home, when I get the money, then I'll be satisfied. Then I'll be happy. No, it doesn't work like that. Ecclesiastes 5.10, it says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is vanity. The Lord is saying through his word this morning that the one who loves money will never have enough to be happy, will never have enough to be satisfied. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from their faith and they've pierced themselves with many pangs. It doesn't say having money is the root of evil. It doesn't say needing money is the root of evil. But the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Do you see the difference? It's about a priority of things in our life, how we prioritize money, how we prioritize our possessions. So what then is the secret to satisfaction? What is it? Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Having a great job that we work hard at, having success, having money, having possessions, having pleasures, and all these things in themselves, they're not bad. But the secret to satisfaction is found in this verse. It says, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. To hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does that mean? Psalms 37 verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What are these verses saying? They're saying, seek your happiness in the Lord, and he will give you the desires and the pleasures of your heart. Don't seek happiness in pleasure. Don't seek it in performance. Don't seek it in possessions. Seek God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Amen. 
and happiness. Happiness, satisfaction is a byproduct of seeking God. If we make happiness in all these other things, the goal in our life, we're going to miss it. 99.99999% of the time we find happiness in the last place we look. We're willing to try anything and everything else. And when it all fails, we say, then I'm going to try God. Then I'm going to try him. And that's the only place that you're going to find satisfaction. I'm not saying 99.999% of the time you're going to find satisfaction. I'm saying that when we look, it's always the last place. Right? Go unto him. If we look to Jesus first, then we, hey, we're less than 99% of the time. Right? You found him in the 80%. Right? We don't wait till the end. So how do we experience this happiness? How do we have satisfaction in our life? Number one, we need to recognize our real hunger and our real thirst. Recognize our real hunger and our real thirst. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. What is it that we're missing in our life? What's not there? Most people don't really know what they want in life. They don't know what that void and that emptiness is that they're trying to satisfy. Most people don't know, but they're searching. Amen? The Bible calls mankind, he calls us spiritual beings made in the image of God. We were made to love God, to know him, and we are known by him, and we are loved by him. But there is nothing in this world that can fill the void of that love that only comes from knowing him. It only comes from knowing him. Our hunger, our thirst, it is our spiritual being longing to be loved, longing to know the love of God. And the sooner that we recognize that, the better we will be. Deuteronomy 8.3 says, And fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you known, that he that he might make you known that man does not live by bread alone, but lives by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. The people of Israel, after being in bondage for hundreds of years to Egypt, were led out by a man named Moses. And they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. There was no fast food restaurants to stop at. They were hungry, and God provided manna for them. It was food from heaven. Early in the morning, he would give them a fresh supply every day. But notice it says, God let them get hungry. He let them get hungry. He did this so they would recognize their need for him and so that they would depend on him. That's how it is. God lets us get hungry in our lives so that we will recognize our need for him. He allows us to be hungry so that we search for him. And he uses all kinds of circumstances in our lives just to get our attention so that we will look to him. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. What's he saying? He's saying that the happiness that we are longing for, we won't find it in our pleasures. We won't find it in our performance. We won't find it in our possessions. It's only in him that we're going to find it. He made each of us with a God-shaped hole, a void in our lives that only can be filled by him. He is the only one that can meet the need. That longing in our life, that thirst and that hunger is only filled in him. Happy are the hungry. Happy are the thirsty. Happy are those that look to God to fill that hole in their life. If we've got problems, if we've got circumstances in our lives that don't look good, God is using them to let 
us know, to get our attention so that we would recognize our real hunger, our real thirst, to love and to know him. The next thing we have to do is we have to change our diet. We have to change our diet. We have to stop eating and drinking spiritual junk food. We need to stop looking for quick fixes and things that only satisfy for a season and never really meet our need. Isaiah 55, 1 through 3 says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live. Look at what verse 2 says. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Just like Isaiah is saying here, we need to quit wasting our time and all of our resources and our money on things that the world has that will never satisfy. Because what we're really looking for is God. We need to stop eating garbage. Just a couple weekends ago as we were celebrating Independence Day, 35,000 people approximately gathered in Coney Island to watch a man eat 63 hot dogs and buns. They watched a woman power down 40 hot dogs and buns. That same day, another man drank a gallon of Nathan's lemonade in less than 30 seconds. They were full. They ate and they drank. But they were, when they were done, I can guarantee you they were not satisfied. Yeah, there are spectacular feats, but they could never live on that diet. It's not a diet they could live on. There's a lot of spiritual junk food that we can consume, but it's not good for our diet. 1 John 2, 16 says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. Pleasure, performance, possessions, they fill us, but they never satisfy. They fill us, but they never satisfy. There's a difference between being full, right, and being satisfied. Have you experienced that? There's a difference between being full and being satisfied. I went to the Nordic Lodge one time. It's not in my notes, so I better be careful. And man, this was like 10 years ago. Maybe longer. You know, anyone know what the Nordic Lodge is? All you can eat steak, seafood, all lobster, all kinds of stuff. I'm not a seafood guy, but I went down. It's the, I think it's the only time I ever felt I was a glutton. And I ate so much food. So many pieces of steak, so many pieces of filet mignon, chicken tenders, and haagen ice cream, and fresh fruit, and all kinds of stuff. And I got out there, and my, I felt the food up in my throat. But I wasn't satisfied. It wasn't that good. But I, I spent so much money, I filled myself up on it. Right? But there's other times I'll go to a nice steakhouse or with some friends and sit down and have a nice steak, some nice vegetables, some good food. And I'll walk away satisfied, not full, but satisfied because it was good. Right? There's all kinds of things that we can use to take up our time, to spend our money on. We move from one to another. We move from pleasure to pleasure, one performance to another, changing one possession for another, thinking and believing the next one is going to make us happy. That next one is going to make us satisfied. It's going to fill us to satisfaction. It doesn't, and it never will. It's just temporary. Maybe this is only true for me. I don't know. But have you ever noticed that our appetites are influenced by our associations? Let me give you an example. I like ice cream, but I'm not an ice cream guy, right? But most of the time, 
I don't go out of my way for it. But almost every time I go out with one particular friend, he insisted on our way home that we stop at Dairy Queen. Right? And I'll always get something. My appetite is influenced by him. But I can tell you that by myself when I'm driving down the road, I don't think I've stopped at Dairy Queen more than twice in my life for myself. But it's influenced by my friend, right? I always get something. Another friend, he likes banana splits. I like banana splits too. But again, I'm not an ice cream guy. But when I go out with him, I'll get a banana split. The other day, I found myself, hey, hey, I need some help with something. Can you come by? We'll get some dinner afterwards, and then we'll get some banana splits. Because I know he likes them. It was so disappointing this week. We, he helped me with some project. We went out to dinner, and then we got out, and the ice cream place was closed. It was so sad. So disappointing. That same friend that likes banana splits, he's not much of a popcorn guy. But when I go to the movies, I like to buy popcorn for myself. And it never fails. A couple minutes into the movies, here comes his huge sausage paws, reaching across, grabbing some popcorn. Right? I've influenced him now. He's eating popcorn. Our appetites are influenced by those that we associate with, right? When we get around hungry people, we get hungry. We get around people who are thirsty, we become thirsty. If we hang around people who like the world's junk food, that's what we're going to eat. That's what we are going to drink. But if we want to have an appetite for godly things, we need to get around people who have a godly appetite. It's infectious. Spiritual hunger is contagious. And if we want to be more hungry, and if we want to be thirstier for the things of God, then we need to get around people who are hungry and thirsty for the things of God. I don't know about you. Sometimes for my life, I just need to get around somebody who, who wants a salad. Right? we got to get around people who want something good. Sorry. All joking aside. Right? But spiritual hunger is contagious. So let's get around people who are hungry and thirsty for the Lord. And when we do, we will find a spiritual hunger and a spiritual thirst in our lives for the things of God. So we experience the happiness and that satisfaction in our life when we first recognize our real hunger and thirst. And then we change our diet. Lastly, we make Christ essential. We make Christ essential in our lives. John 6, 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall not thirst. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall not thirst. Bread, it's an essential of life. Water is an essential for life. We can live on bread and water. If we ever found ourselves in a famine and we could get a hold of water and bread, we could live on these things. And so here Jesus is saying in his own words, He's the bread of life. He is it. He's the water that our bodies need for life. He's what we really need to live. Amen? He and only he can meet that need. If you're looking anywhere else, I'm the bread of life, he says. I'm the water to your dry and thirsty soul. Our culture would ask us to look within ourselves to fill the void, to satisfy our own desires. But it doesn't work that way. When we're hungry, we can't tell our stomachs to feed themselves. No, of course not. It doesn't work that way. We have to go to a source. Spiritually, we cannot be our own God. We have to go to the one 
who created us, the one who knows all about us, who knit us together and formed us in our mother's womb. Anybody ever heard of the Donut Man? If you have kids, you probably have. It was a kid's show. It talked about how God made us all like a donut with a hole right in the middle that only he can fill. God, he made us with a God-sized hole in our lives that only he can fill. He's that missing puzzle piece. He is the bread of life. And we can only be satisfied when we know him and when we love him. Jesus, speaking with the Samaritan woman at the water well, said in John 4, 13 through 14, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I don't know that water is even more essential for your life than bread. NASA, when looking for life throughout the galaxies, has a motto. It's follow the water. Follow the water. Without water, there is zero possibility for life. Zero. We can go several days and sometimes weeks without food, but we can't go more than a day or two without water. I don't know. For me, over the years, over some time, I've liked to watch the show Survivor. Anybody ever watched it? fun game to watch. The contestants are never really given food when they start out. But every single team, yeah, they can, they can win it. Some can win it to start the game, their team. But every single team, when they get to their camp, they have a well. They have a well already there. Because the producers, the people that make the show, know that people can live without food for a period of time. But they must have water. Water, it's the source of all life. Yeah, people can hunt for food. They can look for food. But they need water. Each of us, almost 70% of our body is made up of water. Every cell in our body needs it to survive. We don't just want Jesus in our life. We need him. We can't just want him. We need him in our life. He is essential to our satisfaction. He is essential to our happiness. When your thirsty cost is immaterial. When I went to the races last Friday night, I didn't care that it cost $4 for a bottle of water. It was hot. I was thirsty. I spent the money because I was thirsty. If it came down to a hot dog or water, I was going to buy water. It didn't matter the cost. This is what it means. This is what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's to hunger and thirst for God and the things of God. There's literally three attitudes, things, three ways that we can respond when it comes to our life. We want God in our life. We need God in our life. Or we've got to have God in our life. We want him, we need him, or we've got to have him. I don't know about you. i got to have Jesus in my life. I need him. I more than need him in my life. i got to have him. I want him in my life. One day, almost 27 years ago, that's where I was at. I had to have God. I couldn't make it without him. There was something missing, a hole, a void, a longing in my life that only he could fill. I couldn't find satisfaction in the things of the world. I couldn't find it in relationships. I couldn't find it in drinking. I couldn't find it in smoking. I couldn't find it in taking drugs. It was only found in Jesus Christ. How many have that same experience? How many of you have had that same experience? To say, I could only find satisfaction in Jesus. It was only found in him. Chris, if you could come. If you need Jesus in your life, if that's you today, 
you're here, you're watching online, you recognize you have a need for him. Saying, I've got to have God in my life. I can't make it without him. He made you. He made me. There's an emptiness in my life that I know only he can fill. Maybe this morning you're here and deep down you're asking yourself, who am I? Why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? Who is God to me? You're not going to get those answers from things of this world. You're not going to find it in the club. You're not going to find it having sex. You're not going to find it getting high. These are the questions of life. There are a hunger and a thirst to know God. That's what it means to hunger and to thirst. Look at these two verses with me. John 6, 35 and 51. So Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. We jump down to verse 51. It says, he said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Here's the start of our satisfaction. We have to come. We have to believe. We have to eat. Our appetites, our thirst are not filled until we do something about it. We may be hungry, our stomachs may growl, but until we take action, there's nothing in our life that is going to change. We need to come to him. We need to believe in him. We need to eat of him. We've got to take action. Just like when you're hungry and you go to the fridge and you go and eat, spiritually when you're hungry, we need to do these three things. We need to come. We need to believe and we need to eat. Come to Christ. Come to believe in Christ. You eat of him. That's to receive him into your life. If you're here, if you're online, you've never taken that step. Today is the day. I'm not here to tell you that life becomes a bowl of cherries. Things don't become perfect. You're feel, still going to have circumstances and struggles, and things are going to be hard. You may even be persecuted. But in all those things, you won't find that you're unhappy. You'll be with Christ and He with you. You aren't alone. You can be happy and satisfied no matter the circumstances. For others here today, you may say, I know Jesus. I've known him, but I've wandered from him as my essential source. I've been trying to find satisfaction and bring it into my own life. Doing it my way. Life's good, but there's still something missing. I've left off being sold out for him. And I've started to hunger and thirst for things around me. I need to get back to Christ as my essential. I need to get back around those that hunger and thirst for the things of God. I need to come back into fellowship with Christ. I need to come back into fellowship with his church. This message is for me today. I need him in my life. How about you? I need him. So where do we go? What do we do? I come. I believe, I eat. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Our satisfaction is guaranteed. Our hunger and thirst for happiness is met in knowing God and being known by Him and in loving him and being loved by him. 
It's in developing a relationship with him, finding our purpose in him. It's in becoming more like him. And as we seek him, we find that the happiness for our life and we become satisfied. Listen, it doesn't come with just a sip. It doesn't come with just a nibble. It doesn't come with just coming to church once in a while or reading scripture once in a while or praying once in a while. It's, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing hunger and thirst for God. God's not in the fast food business. He's about a banquet table. He spreads a feast for us. It's coming together in fellowship. It's taking time with one another. You know, as an electrician, when it comes to, to lighting, when you go into a fast food restaurant, we would hang a ton of lights, make it nice and bright. Why? Because we want to rush people through. We want to get people through. We want to give that and build an attitude and a mindset that I got to get in and I got to get out. But when I go to a nice dinner with my wife, the mood is set different. The lighting is different, right? It's relaxing. It invites me to stay, to be welcomed, and they'll serve all kinds of courses. They want us to take time. Relax, sit down. And that's how it is with Christ. We can't be looking for a quick meal. We need to get with the master. We need to be with him. We need to be gathered with him around the table. We need to hunger and thirst for him. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in his word. Come to church. Come to fellowship. Get around other Christians and stop filling our lives with spiritual junk food and start eating healthy again. Some of us need to fast from social media to get our hunger back or a fast from things that are distracting us of spending time with God and get back to our first love. Amen. Can we pray? Father, thank you for your word. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. God, I know you're getting ready to do something today in your people, in the lives of your people, in the lives of your church, in the light, life of those who've come to recognize you as Lord and Savior of their life, to recognize you as the essential in their life, the source. Recognize that you fill that void of happiness that only comes from knowing you, Jesus. If this fits you this morning, make this your prayer. Jesus, I come to you. Or maybe, Jesus, I'm coming back to you. I believe in you. I want to eat of you. I've tried so many other things. I've been to so many other places, and they don't work. I believe in you this morning, and I know you have a purpose for my life. I know you love me, and you've died for me. Help me to understand that better, to know you in your fullness. In your name we pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. How many are thankful for God, the source, the essential source for your life? I know I am. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you that you promote us, that you teach us. You teach us the ways of real happiness. It's not in pleasure. It's not in performance. It's not in possessions. It's not in power, position, or prestige. But it's in a personal relationship with you. 
Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God is good. Amen? Amen. He is so good. I have a benediction for you today, not from Scripture, from my heart. Be imitators of Christ, walking in his peace, walking in his love, and walking in his righteousness. Share it with everyone you meet. Go in peace and live by faith this morning. God bless you.